Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here. Um, my name is Ashkan Karbis Rushan. You can call me Ash. I'm the CEO of WatchMojo.com. We are a producer of premium video content, so music videos, sorry, music interviews, profiles of celebrities, travel videos, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I also write quite a lot of propaganda on Media Post and TechCrunch covering the industry. Um, if you notice some of the names are different than your printed material, that's because we had two cancellations, but I like to think with all due respect to the two cancelees that we even improved the panel. So joining me are, I'm just gonna give you their names and I'm gonna let them give you their title, what they do, and how wonderful their companies are. Eric Anderson, Mark Suster, uh, Michael Schwab, and AJ McGowan. So take it away, Michael. So Michael Schwab, I'm from Tremor Video, and I run Mobile Strategy and Network. You're up. I'm Mark Suster, I'm a partner at uh, the largest venture capital fund in Southern California, which is called GRP Partners, and we are very actively investing in digital media. Uh, Eric Anderson, I'm Vice President of Content and Product Solutions for Samsung Consumer Electronics and uh, I get to play with the smart TVs and now the smart refrigerators and uh, Wi-Fi cameras and things like that and um, help run our strategy as well as our service delivery and uh, uh, service offerings. I'm uh, AJ McGowan. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Unicorn Media. Uh, we are a digital media management company um, specializing in uh, large-scale uh, distribution of video for premium content, uh, particularly around mobile and set-top boxes. Excellent. Let's start. So just to make sure we understand the audience here, show of hands, who is a member of the media? Okay. Show of hands, who is a content producer? Okay. Who here is in the, on the tech side, enabling all this? Okay. And who here is advertising, an advertiser, an agency? Okay. I think you no get way. the problem with the industry. I'm kidding. Okay, so let's get started, <laughs> Michael. Um, eMarketer comes out with a lot of very bullish uh, forecasts. I'm not going to run down every year, but let's say this year, U.S. video advertising is a two billion industry, give or take a few hundred million. They project that in 2015, it's going to be a $7.1 billion market. So just comment on that. Where is that going to come from? Is it bullish? Is it realistic? Historically, have ex advertising succeeded forecasts, or have we always missed and then had excuses? Take it away. So I, I, I think we have exceeded forecasts, and I think that's going to come from um, everyone that's playing in, every advertiser that's playing in the digital space today, right? So you have a lot of folks um, even though online video has exploded um, and there are a ton of advertisers that are participating, there are also a ton of advertisers that are not participating or are participating in uh, different channels of digital. So they, they, might be, they might be just investing in search or they might be dabbling in display. Maybe now they're dabbling in expandable banners and those folks are then going to transition and start spending within the true video world. Um, so I think that you're going you're gonna to get a huge growth from there. Um, just, it, just advertisers that, that haven't played traditionally. You're also going to get um, a, t a significant amount of revenue from um, an area that I really focus on, which is mobile. Um, so you're going to get tablet. With, with all the eyeballs going towards tablets, going towards mobile phones, you're also going to see uh, dollar shift there as well. So I think uh, it's not only you know advertisers that are not participating now, but it's 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 folks that want to hit uh, eyeballs on on different uh, devices. I would love to know what mark you're writing, so you can either comment on that, you get an option, <laughs> or I'm going to ask you a different question. So it's your call. Um, I, I'm a content guy. I love the fact that you invest in digital media. I think that's great. We've not raised VC, but. If you take a look candidly and, and fairly, most of the VC-funded content companies have crashed and burned. Fair assessment or not, Ripe went through 45 million, <laughs> Next to Networks went through 30 million. What did they do wrong? Was it externalities, macro, was it specifically execution was off, the strategy was off? You're investing in some content bets, a lot of which count on the YouTube platform. Yeah. So tell us more about your vision and what others did wrong, what you think is the better way to go and how you can actually monetize and profit from content. Well, one of my favorite sayings is being early is the same thing as being wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, why did AltaVista not become Google? 
I mean, it was a pretty damn good product. Um, I think there are a number of factors that really had to be in place for very large content companies to be produced. Number one, uh, we had to have the infrastructure layer be built. Uh, we ha I mean, I used to work in Anderson Consulting in their tech practice. We were working in the early and mid 90s on something called the full service network in Florida, which was Time Warner's trials of video on demand. And we were promising video on demand was right around the corner, uh, which is already 20 years ago. Uh, almost, and uh, the reality is the factors weren't in place. We didn't have browsers that could support uh, real-time streaming of video. We didn't have the networks that could support it. We didn't have video compression that could support it. We didn't have users that were trained to view uh, a shorter video content. So none of these things were in place. On top of that, you didn't have the ad models that supported it. So really having a distributed advertising model is what's enabled video on Google uh, uh, on YouTube in specific to become so big. So let me give you, uh, you know, just simple stats. Uh, uh, we invest in a company called Maker Studios. Maker Studios was started by a bunch of people who couldn't get into the typical Hollywood system. So they said, we'll do YouTube videos. Back when people thought it was dogs on skateboards. And without raising any money, when we started looking at them, they were doing 40 million video views a month and they had no revenue and there was no business coming in. Um, by the time we invested, they were doing 170 million video views a month. They had raised not a penny. They were profitable at a run rate of about $3 million in revenue. Fast forward less than a year, they're doing 500 million video views in a month. I think next year they'll cross 100 million in sales. And so I've been looking at video companies that have been in the video space for the last 10 years and have interesting businesses. I don't want to name them by name. They're brands you know that are still fucking around at $10 million in revenue, and along comes this company that I think will exceed 100 million in revenue like two years after they turned on monetization. What gives? What gives is that the audience is there. Uh, you know, 108 million people are now watching internet video overwhelmingly on YouTube. Uh, they're watching billions of uh, video views. Uh, there's four companies in Los Angeles, Maker Studios, Movie Clips, Machinima and Vivo that are already doing combined between them now almost 4 billion video views a month. And with this distributed ad platform that's out there with no salespeople, they've done this with zero salespeople, uh, uh, YouTube is selling it all, uh, you've seen a massive explosion in revenue. So there's viable businesses. So guess what? In traditional film and TV, uh, all the talent is getting cut. Writers are losing uh, wages. Uh, actors are not getting paid as much up front or on the back end. You have lighting and sound. And all these people are saying, holy shit, we can do this on YouTube. And like, there are 26-year-old kids who are independent still doing half a million dollars a year in revenue with no business, right? Because they just produce compelling videos and they know how to get viral. And I'm, one last thing, and I'm sorry, and then I'll shut up for a long time is, uh, the history of video has been you create really high cost video, which is, you know, next new networks or whatever was cheaper, but it didn't get cheap enough. Um, traditional network TV at the low end is about $8,000 a minute. A lot of shows are in the $50,000 to $100,000 a minute range. At Maker Studios, we're doing $400 a minute. And you can produce a profitable business at that price point, and I suspect. Now that YouTube's put in, reported 100 million, if there's any journalists I can tell you it's north of 200 million that they actually put in. Uh, I don't know why it's being reported so low. And, uh, and what's actually happening is this low cost, $400 a minute, is gonna creep up to $1,000 a minute and 1200 and 1400 a minute and you're gonna see amazing new content a year from now that's gonna really feel like the kind of content you would wanna watch, not, you know, um, a 13 year old and uh, and this is going to be meaningful content and it's going to be totally disruptive to every normal TV show being put out there and I think it's going to transform the entire industry. All right, two minutes in the penalty box for using the F okay. word. I'm just kidding. I'm going to swear like I'm going to swear like a sailor. You didn't say the F word? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Five minute major. All right, I become a sailor in the second half of the. Okay, I'm kidding. Okay, there's like ten things I would jump on what you said, but let's just keep moving for now. So Eric, uh, the late, great Steve Jobs, in his book, this quote has been you know, picked on by the media many, many times. He said, I finally cracked it when he was talking about you know, TV, bringing his magic to TV, basically. 
I want your opinion on what you think he was referring to. What is it? We know what I is. What did he crack? Um, and what I want to know is, on top of that, is a lot of people say TV is broken. The TV industry is broken. T television sucks. Television sucks. I think that's like the early adopter mindset, and like people maybe in this room or maybe people on this panel. But does mainstream America between like LA, San Fran, and New York actually think that, or is this just us, you know, sort of having really strong drugs that we're on? Um, so. I, I had to give you two questions to make up for the yeah, length of his thanks. answer. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve Jobs obviously was working on, on the TV model for quite some time. I'll tell you this, it wasn't he cracked it as, as it relates to technology. It's not a technology problem or challenge for them. It's a business model challenge. It is, if, if there's a lot of companies that do want to get closer and get into the TV market, which is very different from the mobile market, and there is a different legacy of business and players, whether it be the, t uh, the cable MSOs to the TV broadcasters. And advertising business models are very, very important to those people that have been in that business for a long time. It walks Apple, or even Google for that matter, that want to get into the TV business. And of course, they have, in, in some eyes, uh, competing business models of advertising going up against you know, the, the traditional stuff. So, Probably what he was referring to, and we'll probably find out soon enough, um, is going to be how they were able to appease and to um, work in harmony with some of these uh, TV networks as well as the cable guys. Um, as far as the user experience on the TVs and things of that nature, um, you know, they're going to. This will probably be one uh, area that uh, there's a lot of. You know, people got there before Apple with really good engineering. And you know they'll they'll probably be in a pretty even playing field, but it's as always with Apple, it's it's the uh, it's the in, in the environment or the account and the investment that you have tied up in that content base that keeps you jumping from screen to screen to screen. But probably what he didn't crack um, is that no matter what you do, that TV is a communal device. That is a not a personal device. It's a communal device. And if your family is anything like my family, I'm an Android user, my two boys are Android users, my wife and my daughter are Apple users. And so unless you have that TV with the capability to actually flip-flop and change from one UI to the next, which they probably will, I mean, that's what you're going to have because um, the affinity of that user experience is going to have to play out on a device in a communal environment, which has never been done before. So, um, you know, more from that. Um, TV broken, I think it's about people are used to having more choice and control. The watch by appointment is very frustrating, and the discovery process as well can be frustrating. Um, one of the things that we believe our role is in this streaming and smart TV businesses, it's really about discovery and access. We're not trying to be an aggregator. We're not trying to be a distributor. Um, we do try to help you find the content from content services and sources that you're already familiar with, and hopefully we have them for you, whether that be a Netflix, whether that be a YouTube, whether that be a Ustream or otherwise. Um, what we're trying to do is read our audience and, and make sure that those kinds of things are there for you to access on multiple screens. Um, streaming is. 48% of all usage on the smart TV comes from video streaming. YouTube was number one or number three for the last two years, week over week. Uh, so it's a, it's a really great experience. And I think as, as Mark was talking about, people that are creating new content now have a mechanism where you can see it in 1080p. Or you could even do it in 3D if you want to. So the advancement also in the camcorders and things like that are really catching on and I think uh, an offshoot of, of what's happening from the services, from the device that's showing it, and now the, create, you know, the device that's creating it are also starting to see advancements. Could I just ask you a clarification? 48% of what is streaming? 48% of all viewing on connected TVs? Yes. Meaning? Half of people are what? I mean, that's not including like DVR. That's literally Netflix, Hulu. Visits, right, to those video 
applications that are video in nature as opposed are now to half of even appointment TV, DVR, and anything else? No, no, no. Of, of what people are using our smart TVs for. Okay. Okay. So, so when they're logged uh, when, in. Yeah, when they're so logged when in. When they're not they're, watching appointment right. TV and anything else. They're not else. doing games. Okay. <laughs> they're not doing, you know, weather. You they're, know, watching they're, doing, streaming they're watching streaming TV. I got it. it uh, you know, just to add in, that you'll, you'll be surprised that I'm saying this because I'm digital, but, you know, you ask if TV's broken. TV had its best year last year, yeah. right? It was up 8%. So. It's not that broken. Yeah, I, I think exactly. You'd be surprised. I think a lot of people in the industry are actually the ones who are sometimes, after we put down the Kool-Aid, saying, well, wait a second, TV's having a banner year. What are you guys talking about? Now, there is a lag. Like, magazines were not getting decimated until, like, 10 years after, let's say, but still, or, or newspapers. Just want to move on to AJ. AJ, everybody talks a lot about when will these, you know, when will the ad dollars in digital reflect the audience size? And when will the percentage of advertisers' budget reflect the percentage of time that a user is online? But could you argue that even from a tech backbone infrastructure, we're not there? Take live programming. Advertisers love the Super Bowl. That's like the number one event in North America. In the world, it's World Cup or Olympics, right? The most important events are live. You can't duplicate that around one event with concurrent users. So where are we at right now in terms of realistically in the States, how many concurrent users can watch something live, whether it's a show, a concert, or a sporting event? Well, it's a, <coughs> that's a great question. So um, the, the interesting thing about delivering live, um, live content across the internet um, is that it's really, not, um, it's really not any different than delivering VOD content across the internet. So it's pretty easy to back your way into the numbers. We tend to think of these two things as being completely disparate, uh, but a lot of the protocols that have been released recently, namely uh, Apple HLS or uh, Adobe Ziri or Smooth Streaming, really fundamentally act in a live environment very similarly to the way that they do in a video on demand environment. So when you talk about concurrent users, a lot depends on the, uh, the topology of the caching infrastructure within the local access network. Um, so it's a, it's a very, very difficult question to answer, and it's being approached really in three different ways. Uh, my background prior to Unicorn was actually in traditional CDN, uh, so I know quite a bit about that end of it. And that's sort of the, the traditional model is, you know, build large-scale networks and do a lot of peering um, and sort of flood the access networks with whatever's coming down the pipe. Um, and that's very effective up to a point. Um, but it becomes very difficult to scale when you start to deal with large numbers of users, regardless of whether you're talking about linear or you're talking about VOD. Um, as you break it down to sort of the next level, um, you start to look at what the MSOs are doing right now and the TOCOs are doing right now, which is extensively building out private CDN uh, architectures inside of their networks. Um, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and that's a very, very interesting trend in the industry because it doesn't become a, it doesn't become a linear expansion where if you say the CDNs have you know, 1x capacity and you double that with 1x capacity inside of, the, inside of the actual telco or MSO, that you have 2x capacity. You actually have more like 10 or 50x capacity because you're removing that bottleneck of the bandwidth that exists between the CDN and the local access network. Getting closer down to the last mile eliminates a lot of those problems, and so it gives you a lot of expansion. Um, and then finally, you see you know, some innovative approaches uh, with things like peer-to-peer -peer technology being used to try to remove that all the way down to the neighborhood level. What's really interesting about peer-to-peer -peer is that I think, and this is why I sort of wrap up here on a, on a live perspective, what's really interesting about peer-to-peer -peer is that a lot depends on the, a lot of the efficiency depends on the density of the population that are participating in the network. And when you're dealing with on-demand, um, you have this sort of long tail effect that, that I'm sure we're all familiar with, where you've got a tremendous amount of content that's actually driving utilization. And so your cache population is actually very sparse, and you don't get a high degree of efficiency. Peer-to-peer -peer technologies can be very effective, though, when you start talking about things like live, where when everybody's tuning into the Super Bowl, there's a very high degree of probability that your neighbor um, also has some of that information uh, inside of their access device, whatever that happens to be. So long way around of answering that uh, sort of an unknown problem at this point. I mean, if you look at, if you look at Netflix driving 60% you know, of internet utilization during peak hours, 
Um, it would be very interesting to understand what their concurrency looks like because you could extrapolate up from there that we've got about 40% left. Um, but I think that uh, I think that a lot of the the technical um, the the technical changes that are happening inside of that industry right now are going to magnify the amount of capacity drastically over the course of the next you know couple of years. Um, in regards to the the advertising question, um, it's a it's a very interesting question. We deal with quite a bit at Unicorn um, because we focus on uh, dynamic ad insertion into uh, environments where you don't necessarily have the richness of something like a flash client. Um, so we, we deal with this problem a lot because our customers are making that move right now from being web-only customers um, into mobile and then ultimately into over-the-top or connected televisions, etc. cetera. Um, and their biggest challenge is that linear broadcast ads, which continue to be the sort of um, ad unit of choice uh, for somebody who's trying to watch a two-hour movie or you know even an hour's worth of episodic content are locked into the, the broadcast divisions of the advertising agencies. And so those dollars are sort of locked into these broadcast divisions who aren't yet buying with their ad spend into linear distribution of video content over non-traditional devices. And so instead you just have this subset of the dollars and subset of the industry and it, it sort of becomes a self-perpetuating problem because a lot, of the, a lot of the units, a lot of the ad units that the interactive folks are used to buying um, are interactive. And that doesn't necessarily play well with somebody that's trying to get a 10-foot experience and just sit down and watch you know, two hours of content with their family. So it's, it's a very interesting model that's sort of evolving where I think we're still trying to figure out which one's the cart, which one's the horse, but one is clearly in front of the other. Okay, cool, next question. I'm out of questions, I'm kidding. Okay, so despite all the hoopla and, and you know, bullishness, if you take a look at what Disney, NBC, and Fox are doing, they're retrenching. They're not being more aggressive with free ad-supported content. So realistically, who here thinks that online video is actually a commercial opportunity where they will make money, lots of it, and it won't just cannibalize you know, and become less than what they make offline, and who thinks that online video is actually, when it's all said and done, just like a marketing opportunity? It's a promotional opportunity that gets you to reduce your marketing costs, reduce your distribution costs. And you, know, you might somehow, in some cases, make more profits because your costs are that much lower. But at the end of the day, it's not really going to drive meaningful, material, new revenue business. Who wants to start? Anyway. Go. I'll, start, I'll start there, because we deal with this a lot. I think, I think a lot of it depends on how it's bundled. Uh, you know, the, the traditional model today is supported primarily by sub-level revenue um, that's going back into the broadcasters and the advertising, while a huge part of the model um, is, you know, just one of the revenue streams. I think that the ad dollars will follow if the demand is there, but the question is, are people going to be able to effectively aggregate in such a way that they can cut, you know, sub-deals um, to monetize that content? And that, I think, has to happen, um, and I think that that's a huge opportunity that still exists out there in the marketplace. So when you're talking about online video, I, see if I got this right, I, there are studios now looking at this and saying, you know, to take advantage of this, I'm not going to try to repurpose what I've already got authenticated. I'm going to have new shows that are IP licensed clean, new talent, new ideas, and I'm going to just basically start a parallel universe to really start addressing this new market. Is that what you're talking about? Is heading towards that way? No, it doesn't have to be like produced for a new platform. It could be that they have these, you know, like de taking Dexter. Like, does it ever make sense to put Dexter at the same time as you would watch it on television online ready to go? Are, are any media companies seriously ever gonna get there? That's what we all say we want, but my sort of subtle question is, don't people make money when there is an efficiency? Isn't that what like, the big media companies don't want to give up? Why do we think that will ever change? I mean, disruption can't be the answer to everything. Are the big media companies actually ever going to embrace this? Are they going to learn from what happened to the record labels? Or is it just going to be more like, let's buy time until I retire, and then the next wave of management has to deal with this problem? Well, I guess I'll go back to my answer. I think what they're doing is they're um, they're probably working two different models right now. One is they do have to respect and, and understand their current carriage deals and, and what they've done there and the, and the revenues coming in from that advertising stream there. They do want to do outside of that, but albeit authenticated, but now they are starting to supplement that with clean IP <coughs> types of programming 
And I think probably what's happening is there's a lot of experimentation. In order to actually get, some, get to a decision, as you said, where they run it in parallel or something, you have to build a base of offline or online users where you, that you can point to and say that is equal to or greater than what my legacy um, you know, approach was. And I think that we're seeing the early stages of that, whether it be HBO Go, whether it be you know, some of the things that, um, you know, that uh, News Corp is doing as well with the daily and some other things. So I think you know, we're, we're seeing some hedging, bet, you know, hedging some bets in that direction. Mark and Michael, you guys have almost polar opposite strategies in that, if I'm not mistaken, for example, Tremor doesn't run ads on YouTube, correct? Okay. Meanwhile, Mark, you, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Do you have a comment to make on the record regarding this? No. Okay. So, um, to the reporters, follow up on that. Um, Mark, you're betting everything on YouTube. I mean, Maker is basically a network on top of a network, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's what it is. Which, like, how do you make money on YouTube when, you know, 47% of total video views come on YouTube? They own 80% of internet users, yet you can only run an ad, a pre-roll, once every seven minutes, which obviously limits the inventory that you can monetize. They want certain CPMs, which are pretty not reflective of the industry. So you're clearly both going about it very differently. I just want to get a little bit of discussion going about YouTube. How much of a, you know, how much of a platform is it really to make money? So let's just make sure we have our definitions right. It's not a network on a network. I apologize. Uh, Clarify, go. Uh, <laughs> That's why you're actually here to explain. <laughs> YouTube is the new Comcast. YouTube is an MSO. YouTube is not going to produce content. YouTube bought next new networks, not at all for their content. YouTube is part of Google, and Google's strategy is the, the more content that runs through YouTube, uh, the more ad inventory they have. Now, what no, I haven't seen any journalists report on, so if any journalists in here want to write about it, the deals that YouTube did, and I don't have exclusive, I haven't seen any of the contracts, but I've talked to enough people to know this, they, they gave 200, 250 million dollars in this town to people to produce content, and they require you to exclusively produce it in a YouTube player, which means all the ad inventory is going to be YouTube. They locked up the whole GD talent of this town who's producing low-cost video, and no one else seems to have noticed. Um, and so they're not a network; they are an MSO, they're a distributor, and they want to sell ad inventory. But let's say this. At Maker Studio, our strategy is not a YouTube strategy. I tell young startups, you need to fish in the pond where the fish are, and they're all in YouTube. But then we've got to have multiple distribution streams. So I want to see Amazon get more aggressive about competing with YouTube, and I think they will. I want to see Apple figure out how to play in an open rather than closed world. I think they won't. I want to see Facebook get more aggressive about video and not just socially distributed YouTube widgets, but natively produced inside of Facebook, and I think they will get there. So uh, I also want to see development of owned and operated inventory. Um, I think the challenge of a lot of the people of the past, whether it's Funny or Die or Next New Networks or Revision 3 or anyone who came before was not just the fact that the costs of production were high relative to the ad inventory, but if your strategy from day one is O and O, owned and operated, you've got to be able to drive enough traffic there. And all the fish are at YouTube. So our strategy is very clear. We're going to have a diversified strategy, but we're focused where all the fish are. I want to say one more thing, which is uh, the, 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 network, the, the networks, the existing studios, they're not hedging. They are trying to slow down what is inevitable. Uh, I, I call Hulu publicly, and I think it's changed, but the network perspective is I call it OPEC. O the goal of OPEC, uh, it's a cartel, and what it wants to do is limit the supply so that it can keep prices high. The problem with OPEC is the same problem with any cartel, is each individual member has an incentive to sneak and get around the system. And so you take four or five studios that say, we'll put out Hulu out there, and we'll let it have enough that no VC is going to fund any competitor, because why would you? And we'll have, let it have enough content, but we don't want to do, put our content really through Hulu. We'd rather have it on Fox.com or ABC.com, where we get all the revenue. And uh, so I think that's really what's going on. It was a defensive move to keep 
um, what happening to the music industry happening, and they don't want venture capitalists to fund competition, but the reality is they have the innovator's dilemma. You talked about carriage. Uh, Disney gets paid $4 per subscriber for every ESPN, no, not for every ESPN subscriber, for every subscriber of any MSO, and there's 90 million in the country, uh, paid TV subscribers, uh, actually might be slightly higher than that, but uh, so they get $4, that's $360 million a month. Uh, uh, for anyone who doesn't have their calculator, that's $4.35 billion per year of really profitable revenue, of which probably about 65% of it would go away if the cable packages were unbundled. And the cable packages, that bundle is like an album. You just want to buy your freaking show that you want to watch Mad Men, right? But I got to pay for ESPN as well. Some people don't want ESPN. And so you got to buy the album. And in a world where I control distribution called cable, called satellite, called broadcast, when I control distribution and marketing, I can play that monkey business. The minute you have OTT and freely available content, which is going to come, it's just not going to come overnight, consumers will choose. And consumers will choose singles. And they will want to bundle their own bundles, and there will be different pricing models, but the days of being able to ram you, these carriage deals where you pay for everything, your $69 a month, are, are, are limited, and they can't respond to the new entrants because they have all this profitable revenue to protect. It's right. classic innovator's dilemma. It's going to be like the music industry. You watch. Anybody else want to touch on that? Or? It's funny, that was one of our lightning round questions, but you sort of beat me to it. Okay, um, you always hear about cord cutting, cord cutting, and the cable industry is like almost is either in denial or they have some stats. I mean, I think the stats are the biggest BS because you could find a stat to support your position. Is cord cutting happening or is it overblown? And, and it's actually, you know, TV's doing better than ever, basically. Oh, I thought it was in the penalty which, box. No, 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 there's no penalty. This is good. You're, you're winning points with me. This is what we want. So I, I always ask, which cord are you talking about? You um, tell me. You work at Samsung. Which cord are we, should we be talking about? Um, because you what's do work at Samsung, is, right? I'm is, um, is, you know, the, the cable companies are launching applications themselves in the coming weeks and months. Um, they're going to be some of the biggest pieces of shit. <laughs> <laughs> OTT app, cord I'm cutting app. <laughs> um, uh, they're going to be some of the biggest, you know, cord cutting OTT applications out there. So um, I think that, you know, it's, um, are people doing it? Yes. Are they ready to do that inflection point where they just want to go 100%? No. Um, so I, but you know, I think what's happening now is people are exploring a tremendous amount from their PC, from their smart TV, and from their tablets as to how they can piecemeal this type, type of stuff together. And in some cases, um, you know, that I think now the challenge is, is we're probably in need of companies coming in to help manage that process from a UI, UX perspective of where did I put that asset? You know, what account do I have now? How am I paying for all this kind of stuff? So I think um, uh, you know it, it is happening, but I, I you know I, I think it's going to be in transition phase for quite some time. Yeah, I mean I, I also think that the the services that are out there that that normal you know normal people are, are have access to like Hulu Plus or Netflix, and those are those are the the tools that they're using to cut the cord, I guess per se. Um, they're still not up to snuff with with a cable subscription, right? You can't access news. You can't access live sports. So, you know, it's, it's out there, it's great. I'm sure some people are doing it that are not into sports or news, but for the majority of America, it's, it's not gonna happen. It all kind of goes back to what's in your bundle, right? And, right. That's, and that's really the, the fundamental question is, are people going to be able to effectively bundle this content and a lot of that goes back to whether or not they can work a model that actually gets the carriage back to the, back to the content creators in a way that's meaningful to them. And I, I think all of the approaches that we've seen to date have been sort of virtual bundles, if you will, um, that you know, it's always about sort of aggregating up. Um, it, it's about one of two things. It's either about a narrow bundle, like something like Hulu, um, or you see folks that, like what Google's doing with Google TV, you're trying to effectively create a virtual bundle, which is, whatever happens to be available out there on the internet, I'm gonna wrap that all up into some sort of usable UI 
um, that, uh, that may or may not be effective for what my user is trying to get. And until, until those things start to intersect, um, you know, I, I don't think that we see a lot of adoption. I can tell you how the cord's going to be cut. I know it. I know the future. So here's what it is. <laughs> uh, uh, if you look at, so my wife, uh, so fortunately I have inside data. My wife, um, uh, many years ago. Which cord are we talking about? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> so, um, so my wife worked at Sky, uh, which is the satellite TV provider in the UK. And they have the most amazing quant jocks there, and it's a very well-run network, and it's a significantly better uh, um, user experience than anything you'll find in the US. And um, all of their quant jocks spent their time on one thing, how much to pay for soccer rights. That drives people to pay. And here's how it's going to happen. Here's how it's going to go down. Here's how the industry is going to start to unravel. There's a company that is so profitable, has so much money, and has such a vested interest in penetrating your living room that they're going to put their money to work to screw the MSOs, and they're called Google. And what I think Google is going to do, and I don't have any inside information, even though my wife used to also work at Google, um, is they're going to realize that that's the way to get Google TV into your living room eventually and they're gonna try to be nice with everybody, and eventually when they can't be nice with everyone, uh, they're gonna say, well, we're gonna have to do scorched earth. So scorched earth right now is I'm gonna give $250 million to 100 producers who are gonna produce low cost YouTube content, and what that's gonna do is finally force the studios to come talk to me to get Google TV content, which they haven't been willing. I think it's so, so smart. I'm going to scorch earth, get all this content to F you guys, and so come see me. And I think eventually what they're going to do is they're going to buy sports rights. And when they realize that if they can get NFL, NBA, MLB, like NASCAR, like they can just crack one, you will start to see people say, well, why are we paying $80, $90, $100 a month for cable? And that's the one thing, like you can already get your shows delayed, I can watch uh, you know, John Stewart uh, uh, on ComedyCentral.com or whatever. Uh, I can watch the news delayed. I can get video elsewhere other than sports, and I think Google will crack it. Yeah, I'll tell you what Google's going to do. Google should make you sign an NDA. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any inside information at all other than on Samsung. Just a, a question for you. Doesn't that look, though, more like a, a traditional network? I mean, don't you see the same fragmentation there where, you know, Fox can go out and write a big check for football rights, and all of a sudden they're in business? And so, for the consumer, you don't necessarily see that MSO level consolidation there. You see fragmentation as these things start to get split apart. I, I personally believe that on the internet, everyone says, the internet only has one big advantage, but on the internet, everyone says it's great because content's freely available and fragmented. And you can go, all you're gonna do is have the new MSOs, the new distributors, the new power brokers, the new people to try and screw content. And um, eventually, yes, I think Google's gonna become that and internet's gonna look like that with one exception, which is on TV, you spend all this money to produce something, you have to market like hell to get people to watch it, and once they watch it and you come out with your next show, you gotta spend all this money on market and get them to watch that next show. What's different on the internet is when I produce content, I have the right to build a relationship with my viewers, and over time, I collect subscriptions, I collect email addresses, I collect Facebook likes, I collect Twitter followers, and I have the ability to actually promote my stuff myself, and the way I think the future looks is TV is gonna look more like guilt group than, than it does like traditional TV, because I have a right to have an email list of 20 million consumers in my show and send them what I want to send them and drive views that way. And that's the power that I think content has in the future. Only when content companies realize that they're really tech companies. And unfortunately, they don't realize that yet. And, and just to get back to you know, that deal that, that YouTube just did, and to get back to your question about Tremor advertising on YouTube, I think what that, that deal ultimately does for YouTube is it says, OK, we now have curated content, right? A big problem with a lot of the advertisers out there and YouTube is that it's, it's, it has a stigma for being UGC. So now what they're saying is, here you go. Here's your professionally produced content. And, uh, and feel free and, and feel safe to advertise on YouTube. All right, I want to do a little bit of lightning round. So 
almost one word answers or multiple choice, and then we're gonna open it up to uh, Q and A. <laughs> so, in uh, five years, Hulu is A, status quo, B, sold or IPO, or C, dead, because it gets... What was A again? A is uh, status quo. Well, is there an upside case? Um, sold. It's sold by someone, IPO, or C. Isn't that the exit that you VCs want? How is that not <laughs> well, there's, a, there's a difference between sold versus IPO and become a big company. Prosperous. Upside. That's Prosperous. the, okay. okay. So one is base case, B is upside, C is dead because big media says it's coming, it's becoming a headache. A, B, or C? I say C, dead. For the first time in history, I finally believe upside. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think they got a niche and I think it's going to grow. I think someone's going to bolt them on. I think it's, I think status quo. I think uh, that they continue to do what they're doing and do it well, but when those content deals start to come up here in the next year or two, I think they're going to struggle with figuring out how to monetize that. But here's the defense, okay, and here's why it changed. I ran an event last night called The Future of Television. I wish I knew you guys were in town. I would have invited you. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you I, gotta knew get, I was in town. I got to gotta get you guys on my email distribution list for next year, but Mike Leisner came and spoke, and the Hulu's guys were there and everything. Uh, they, I, I asked for the public data so that I could say this. They now have 1 million Hulu Plus subscribers at $8 a month, which means they have about 100 million in revenue now coming in from subscription businesses in addition to their three or 400 million or whatever they have on ads that they have to share. And that's money they don't have to share the same way. And what they're gonna do if they wake up, Kyler is probably one of the most talented guys in our industry, and they haven't done it yet. But what I keep telling them is, you guys need to do original programming, original programming, original programming. Fuck this 22 minute networks TV stuff that you're gonna get screwed on. Like, you need to start doing four minute, eight minute, 12 minute. Like, the idea that everything has to be 22 minute is a relic of limited distribution. But once you have subscribers, just like Netflix, you earn the right to procure content. And I think they're gonna start procuring content from all the people who are distributing it via YouTube so, today. So, and when they, do you think that's gonna happen before the, the deals that they have, the licensing deals that they have are gonna run out? Yes. So much for lightning round. This is like October drizzle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm kidding, no, it's great. Uh, Netflix, best years are A, behind it, ahead. Best years, behind it. Anyone else? I'd have to say behind it as well. I w can we, is there a status no. quo? <laughs> yeah, you can go with status quo. I'll go status quo. Ahead. Ahead, okay, interesting. I think Hulu and Netflix should merge and they'll be the most powerful player in the space. Hulu and Netflix, okay. We're, that's very, okay, Google or Apple, if you had to pick between either one of those two companies, can't be both. Who's gonna be the dominant player that's gonna disrupt, kill, eat into TV's many, many billions? Google. Google. Amazon. Okay, you're allowed, you're, in this case, you're allowed to add. I would say Google. Google, okay, interesting. Um, right now we talk about the second screen, assuming TV is the first screen. I think many of us probably spend more time on a s screen other than TV, but I think the insinuation that it's the first screen is because of money. Are we ever in the next 10 years going to live in an environment where the same content across the board could be on any device, PC, Mac, uh, sorry, I mean your computer, your television, your cellular phone, or your tablet. 100%. Next 10 years, at yeah. the same time. 100%, yes. Within 10 years, really, okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Wait, I, I'm sorry, I didn't. You, are you ever gonna be able to watch a Monday Night Football on any device you have? Uh, well, to, to answer your first thing, which uh, for the data, 5.3 hours is the average amount of time people watch TV today. 3.1 hours is the amount of time people spend online today. 33% of all 12 to 17 year old time spent online is watching video. Um, uh, your devices um, are, I mean, we're gonna in 10 years be agnostic to the kind of device based on the kind of content we wanna watch. And I think the big winner there, and I'm not saying it just cause Eric's sitting next to me, Samsung, I don't understand how Samsung went from like the company I kind of didn't even really understand who they were to the company that everybody I know is buying their devices and Sony and Panasonic and everybody else seems to be like lightning years behind. Mm -hmm. And I think the only disruption I worry about for Samsung and the TV is when Apple does their TV. Mm -hmm. that a yes? You think everything's gonna be on the same device within 10 years? Well, um, so the short answer is yes, but I'd qualify that. 
I, I, don't, I don't know what we're learning now with our in-screen strategy is, and I think when you, this is a good example, you said, will you be able to watch NFL football on every device at the same time, during the same session, integrated, or separate sessions? It's more sessions? the fact that they don't care. There's no windows, that, you know, it's like they'll make their money, you know, I'm not sure if you can get it on four screens because of bandwidth limitations, but I'm just saying, from a in terms of, exactly, a rights, a licensing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I do think what we'll see is people are going to, and programmers are going to get smarter about maybe I don't show the game that you're watching on your 55 inch screen the same way that I would show it on your four inch screen. Yeah. And there's different ways, you know, now we're getting into automatic content recognition, intelligent programming, you know, kind of dual, dual scripts and dual programs happening at the same time depending on the screen. And so I, I think we're going to have the same. We're going to have a, a similar experience for an NFL game, but it may not be the exact same thing on every screen. Before you answer, show of hands who's going to ask a question, because we have one mic, so whoever's got questions, you can start putting up your hand so we can walk around accordingly. Okay, sorry. So <clears throat> I, think, um, I think from a licensing perspective, um, it'll happen if there's money to be made. I mean, that's sort of the, the history of the, of the entire entertainment industry, is that they will embrace the technology if they can make the money. And, um, I think to date there have been quite a few technical hurdles getting there. Um, our, we, this sounds self-serving, but we actually specialize in this problem. Um, and so we're seeing this all day, every day, is that the folks that have the rights, who produce the content, who now that we can give them a monetized experience across all screens, are absolutely clamoring down the door to get there. Um, they don't want to hold back. They want to be on every screen. They want that content on every screen. They were just waiting for somebody to open up the revenue opportunity. Okay, last question in lightning round. Will the movie slash television, you know, Hollywood and all that, will it suffer the same fate as newspapers or the music industry? Um, or will they somehow survive it? Or will they face a shrinking that is even more severe? Shrinkage. Which one? I think will history repeat itself, for lack of better words? I don't think so. I think they, it's a different time. I think uh, they got probably they have a better support group than the music industry did when this was starting to happen in the music industry. There's many other people and ideas and, and new businesses out there that could actually help uh, support and maintain uh, part of their core business, but they're going to have to change in a lot of the different ways that we talked about. I think, um, I think that they'll make it through. I think that uh, one of the big differences between the music industry and sort of the, the broadcast and the studio industry First of all, the broadcast and studio, the video industry, if you will, is a much bigger business and always has been. And secondly, it's always had sort of roots in technology uh, because they had to deal with things like broadcast and carriage out to a variety of different platforms. And so I think they're used to um, overcoming technical challenges. While they've been slow to get there, and I think that there's a lot of room for new players to start to infiltrate, I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Gentlemen here, before we? I think they'll be fine. They'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I've spoken with a few pe folks in the entertainment industry, and, and they're, they're, they're uh, f way farther along than, than I had anticipated, so I, I, I don't see a problem. Massive disruption. I think uh, technology, the one thing we know about technology is that it's deflationary. It's deflationary in classified ads. It's deflationary in CPMs. It's been deflationary in music. I believe it'll be deflationary in television, and I think the cost structures of the studio system in terms of how much it costs to produce content won't enable them to compete in the future. I don't think they go away. I think they get greatly reduced and I think you'll see three or four or five totally new players that emerge with lower cost infrastructure and understanding the nature of content, the nature of the narrative, the nature of how consumers watch content in the future is fundamentally different. And I think that what we'll find over time is that different business models emerge when you go from an oligopoly to open competition. It creates new opportunities, but I don't think they're gonna survive in their existing incarnation. Yeah, the web definitely shrinks industry, so that's, okay, question. Well, what do you think about the content discovery today? Is it a solved problem, or if not, what, what is the ideal content discovery experience, you think? in the world of the streaming video world, it should look like. Okay, just so uh, somebody, so the, the question is, what do you guys think of content discovery, basically? Yeah, content discovery, what do you guys think of content discovery? Is it A, good, B, bad, <laughs> or fine, sucks? 
How could it be improved? Depends on whether it's done well or not. I mean, we're, we're all used to content discovery in the sense of, um, you know, 70 years of somebody deciding what content I was going to discover and put it in front of me in a linear channel. Um, so I think that uh, if we can get to the point where technology is as effective as somebody who really understands their demographic and knows how to tailor the content they want to put in front of them, then I think it's very disruptive. I think um, if we approach it the same way that we did things like text search, um, I don't think that, uh, I don't think it's as disruptive. I don't think it's as interesting for somebody to sit and browse through uh, content when they're looking for a relaxing 10-foot experience. Uh, our, our experience is that, you know, one, that's one thing that we're trying to do with our TVs is better search, better recommendation. But to play that game, again, it's not a technology problem. To play that game, you gotta get the boys to play with you on allowing their metadata to enter into your search <coughs> engines and your recommendation engines. and. They're just not ready, cable companies or our broadcasters aren't ready to just hand over the metadata to enable those types of tools to make it really easy. You know, they want you to pick a side. They want you to go to Comcast or they want you to go to, you know, that other. And as long as there's those fences kind of drawn and nobody's willing to share that metadata, you're going to get very, you know, uh, siloed approach to search recommendation and discovery. I think uh, yet again you're going to see new players because entrenched players who have the innovator's dilemma, who have every incentive to block innovation, never innovate. And we just look at the telco industry, look at how long we had such a crappy mobile experience because you had handset manufacturers and operators with a vested interest in protecting those. And once that hegemony was broken, you've just seen massive uptake of innovation of mobile that's gonna create a bigger industry for everybody. So what I'm seeing a lot more of is companies that are doing universal controllers on your mobile devices, on your tablets that are gonna enable you to search and find, share, curate content. And they're getting more clever about how they do it. They're starting to integrate with your DVR and allow you to control your DVR. They're allowing you to screen shift. And I think it's likely to be a new entrant uh, the biggest challenge for them is how do you acquire enough customers? Right. Uh, you know, how do you build a brand and acquire enough customers to be able to do that? They got to bolt on to a, but a, I think, a platform at some point to get started. I think someone like Samsung could actually do it. Like, I think working with a software company, I think you guys could do something and, meaningful. And yet, I think we could. I think we would also have to come to the realization that somebody can do it better than us. If yeah. you guys partner up, I want a finder's fee. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Uh, sorry. Yeah, no, I would just say, you know, the other thing is you're going to see publishers adopt softwares that they're going to be able to become more, much more sophisticated and savvy as to who's watching their videos, who's engaging with them, what type of content they should be producing that will also help, um, help users find the type of content that they want to watch. I believe there was another question, like a few more questions. Hi there. Uh, my question uh, deals with something that I don't think you guys have really touched on much. In fact, in a lot of the sessions, they haven't touched on. Uh, currently, in, in the, the U.S. Uh, Congress, there are several different laws uh, uh, being bantered about that deal with uh, internet, or intellectual property, uh, that deal with uh, net neutrality. There was a big news story this morning about the White House saying that they were going to veto uh, anti-net neutrality laws and so forth. And, and obviously, based on someone's politics, that could either be a hope or it could be a threat. And, and I don't necessarily want, I want to get into, into personal politics, but, but I wanted to know if, if any of you see the, the government in, uh, being a player in, in, in how this turns out, or if, if that's really just kind of a red herring right now. If I could just tweak that question, there's two, like e-parasites and protect IP, two laws in the House and Congress that the content lobby is trying to pass. I want your opinion on those, like basically, is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act which was basically set out to let user-generated sites prosper, but then it put the onus on the content owner to look for the infringing content and send out the takedown request. Is that fair, 10 years after, to put all of the pressure and the onus on Viacom or NBC to go out and say, hey, YouTube, take down Lazy Sunday, and then somebody else, uh, sh who should be responsible for that, the tech company that created this sort of disruptive tool, or the media company that's like, we never signed on to this, why are you disrupting us, why are you using our IP to build a business around it? I think the fundamental question there is more, um, do, those, do those use cases actually disrupt 
um, the ability for premium content to actually find an audience and to find a market share. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of that depends on what the premium content owners do with it. Um, I think that uh, that that really comes from sort of the fundamental question because when we talk about when we talk about UGC, I don't think anybody thinks that's the future of online video consumption. Um, or it, at least I, I assume not. Um, it's certainly a component, but I think that the even YouTube doesn't believe that that represents the whole picture. Um, and so the real question becomes, are we at a point where those laws um, are, really, are really a hindrance um, to anybody's operations? <coughs> and if, uh, if they were changed, does that really impact anything? Um, and I struggle with that a little bit because I think we've reached a point where there is so much content that's coming so quickly in so many different avenues, there's not as much incentive for somebody to put Lazy Sunday up on YouTube um, when you can just as easily go to Hulu or to SNL.com and go watch it. Uh, more questions, and I promise I won't hijack the question and tweak it. And <laughs> Max? Uh, I'm Chitaj Kumar from Concurrent. Um, I get excited about Hulu getting a million customers at $8 a pop. Uh, I get excited about Netflix having 22 million. Uh, but then I think about cable, telco, and satellite. 105 million plus subscribers in the US alone, over $100 per, per person today. So what do you guys think is going to happen to cable, telco, and satellite in five years? Lightning round for you guys. Well, I'm a venture capitalist, and I like to say I'd much rather uh, fund the barbarians than the people inside the gate eating, uh, you know, inside the castle eating tea, uh, drinking tea and eating cake. I think, uh, uh, you know, fat, happy, high margins, uh, uh, it, it's hard to sustain it in a world of innovation and, you know, in a world where uh, I think technology enables deflation. And so I will always fund the Visigoths. I think that um, it's going to be interesting in the next 18, 24 months when they do roll out these applications. And I think you'll see a difference between the telcos and the traditional cable companies, the Verizons and the AT&Ts versus the Comcast and the Time Warner cables and such. And I think you're going to see some pretty aggressive and probably innovative ways that the telcos, keep in mind, they want to run. I mean, they want to acquire. They don't have to um, appease anybody about what territory they're in and this, that, and the other thing that's kind of you know, legacy baggage. So they're going to run hard. And we're going to see probably more creative things that they're going to want to do outside of a, a Fios infrastructure than what you would see over on the other side of what Comcast, Time Warner, and some others are comfortable in doing just because of the close-knit families that they've created. So, um, but I, it's uh, in, the, in the next, you know, I don't know if 10 years, but in, certainly in the next three to five years, I think that uh, it's, for most of them, it's about trying to reduce that churn that's happening in double digits every month over month and uh, also being able to break out and think about new creative ways that they can go across device and to also make it is still a lucrative way that the, the programmers and broadcasters can, can see, still see them as their primary um, partner. One last question. All right. Uh, one year ago, young Glenn Beck was making a alleged uh, two and a half million bucks uh, to do an hour of uh, cable TV in the afternoon. Now he boasts that he's on track to make some 20 million a year ushering uh, fans past his 495 or 995 a month paywall, yet he's buying commercials in Rush Limbaugh to promote that. When Fox does a presidential debate, he's got a TV ad that says, miss me. So the question is, how much does the new platform adoption depend on a shove to migrate brand loyals from the old platform. I think as le at least as much as any other industry. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've lived in a world, I think we tend to, uh, to hyper-focus on IP as if, um, you know, the, the internet sort of exists in a bubble. Uh, but when we talk about media, this is just the, the same old strategy um, writ large across the internet, um, but, or across broadcast. Um, but it's the same thing that we've seen forever. I mean, it's, uh, 
it's not uncommon to, to see, or in, and particularly it did not used to be uncommon, to see advertisements for new television shows in magazines or in newspapers or in a variety of other places um, that had nothing to do with broadcast. So I think that um, cross-marketing is, is just a reality of being in the entertainment business. And it's not any difference in, in the, the internet entertainment business than it is anywhere else. Yeah. Right. No, I was going to say I 100% agree. I mean, integrated marketing, you, um, I mean, look at any of the, the major marketers out there, advertisers, that, that's what they, they live off of is, is repeating that message. And, and I'll be the first one to say, and like I said, I'm, I'm solely digital, and that proves that, that TV is a, you know, is a viable marketing channel. Yeah, I think just to close up, I think the bigger issue is the celebrities that dip their toes in online. Uh, how, much, how many of them do it because it's a fad? How many do it like Glenn Beck because he has to sort of recreate himself and he has like a clean slate and could do that? And how many of them actually believe in it? I, I don't actually think that for, like, if Ashton Kutcher is now making millions of dollars from CBS to be in Two and a Half Men, guess what? Catalyst, his like little, you know, online video thing, it's gonna be forgotten because he's not gonna want to have any time to do that if he's still making all this money from TV. So I think that is different, but I agree with what they said. I think it's just logical to use the existing leading platform to drive awareness to something. Look, look at Hulu. Hulu, they were the ones that were in, uh, advertising in the, the Super Bowl. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks, to yeah. the panel. Thanks. Can you still have gas? Where did you